I'm a psychologist, educator, and founder of Home, uh, which is a haven for your psychospiritual wellness. I bridge Islam and psychology together, and I provide um, psychospiritual services through an Islamic psychological lens, such as uh, classes, courses, transformation programs, and retreats. So I'm really big on analyzing the psychological barriers that come between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our Creator. I'm really big on understanding how our mental and emotional health impact our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm also big on understanding the other way around, which is how our spiritual health impacts our mental and emotional wellness. And that was the focus of my doctoral dissertation, an Islamic psychological approach to therapy. I was really um, interested in analyzing and shedding light on what Islam has to offer to the world of psychology and to, to, to our psychological wellness. Okay, now I'll continue. <laughs> so this topic, you know, as a psychologist I was saying, I you know I sit with people constantly who struggle so much in their lives because they never felt that they were important or loved by their parents. And so then can you imagine then the type of struggle and distress that we feel or may feel because we never connected to the fact that we were important or loved by the one who created us and our parents. And this is something we don't talk about a lot because unfortunately, a lot of times when we, when we, the way that we have understood our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very much about obligation, right? It's very much about do this, don't do this. It's very much almost like a business kind of transaction that even the way we talk about our purpose in life, it, it's void of this concept of feeling loved and feeling important to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a lot of times when we talk about our purpose, we quote the ayah in the Quran that says, we, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we have not created jinn or ins except to worship, except for worship, right, ibadah, right? And so when we understand ibadah, we understand it as, do this, don't do this, right? We understand it as, you know, okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created me to fulfill these obligations. Check, 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 this is why I'm here. I'm gonna do this, check, 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 and then die. <laughs> and unfortunately, a lot of people, that's the way they understand their relationship with Allah. That's the way they understand their relationship with their creator. But the Adana, the scholars, in analyzing Abada, it's so much, they, they shed light on how much more it is than just obligation than just me checking off these, uh, these commands that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has, has asked us to do. It is about experiencing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's about knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's about loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's about having a relationship that is wholehearted, that is fulfilling. We were put in this world to experience Him. <coughs> if I could summarize it, it doesn't do justice to the word Abada because so many times I've analyzed this word and to you know to such a depth that we don't like we it would like it is so much more. And so but if I could you know summarize it simply it would be to experience God. To experience the one who made us. Because think about this. Think about how much we talk about you know love in this world. Think about how much you know you know, all, what are all our songs about in our society? Love, right? I remember like growing up, I used to wonder like, why are all the songs about love? <laughs> like it's either about love or heartbreak, right? But everything's centered around love. Think about that. Why? Because every soul craves love. And think about how much we talk about, you know, the type of bliss that is experienced when two people are in love, right? Think about that. So then imagine, you know, we, we, know, we know that like oxytocin is released in the brain, which is a neuro, um, you know, a neurotrans, um, a, a feel-good hormone, right? It's a feel-good, like, like, it makes you feel good, it makes you feel open, it makes you feel, like, awakened, right? So then think about, if that's just what can happen when a, one person loves another human being, can you then imagine what can happen, the type of bliss you can experience, the type of peace, the type of openings, the type of stability that you can experience when you are in love with your creator. When you're in love with the source of love. <laughs> when you're in love with the creator of love. Can you imagine then how whole and complete you can feel? And so, unfortunately, many of us don't, are not connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that way. We're not connected to how important we are to Him, to how 
how much he loves us, how much he cares for us, how much everything that he has commanded us to do and forbade us from doing is rooted in his love for us. But we spend time chasing love everywhere else. But we don't spend time, you know, seeking that love from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so there are harms to not doing that, to not, to not experiencing that, to not feeling important. There's a sense of not feeling whole. You know, people say, like, you know, they're looking for their other half, right? I actually don't like that concept. Because I don't believe that a love would, would depend our wholeness on anyone. Because then what do we say to the people who are divorced or are widowed? Can they not, do they not have an opportunity to be whole? But where does our wholeness come from? We're not talking about perfection. We're talking about feeling whole. Where does our wholeness come from? To the one who is perfect, from the one who is perfect, from the one who is complete. So Allah created us in a way where we are designed to seek our wholeness through Him. And He is the only one who is worthy of completing us. So that whatever you have in your life or don't have in your life, or whoever He gives you, doesn't give you, whatever He blessed you with or tested you with, you know, like those things are not a means to your wholeness. Those things are a means to you seeking your wholeness through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the only one who is worthy of completing you. And so when we can experience this and when we can work on this, then we have an opportunity for feeling whole, which is what we all want. It's not about perfection, but we want to feel whole. We want to feel complete, right? We want to feel like even our broken pieces, they can come together and we can feel like they have meaning, right? We want to feel like everything is connected. And that we have an opportunity to do that through our Creator. Because if we see everything through the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything is connected. And that is the essence of Tawheed, is that you see Allah's oneness through everything. And so you see whatever you go through in life, you see it. You see it with the eye of your heart fixated on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then everything does become connected because He's the creator of everything that you were witnessing. When you, when you experience love from another human being, it goes back to the creator of love. And so we need to have that connection to how important we are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This topic says you're more important to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the Kaaba. How important is the Kaaba? <laughs> Very important. How many of you have been to Mecca? When you go to Mecca and you see the Kaaba, the people always ask, you know, what's like the people always like uh, try to explain the difference between Medina and Mecca, right? Medina, there's just a sense of like peace and calm, right? When you go to Mecca and you see the Kaaba, there's just a sense of power, right? There's just this like majesticness about it. It's almost like you're looking at something, you're looking at what? A cube, right? <laughs> looking at a square. But obviously, it's so much more than that, right? When we look at it and we see so much more, the eye of our heart sees so much more. It's not just a physical thing. You're looking at something and you feel its power. You feel that you feel that it's under the throne of Allah, which is where the Kaaba is, right? The Kaaba, while we make tawaf around it and circulate it, you know the angels are making tawaf around the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the throne of Allah. So it is powerful and you feel it. But we are more important to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the Kaaba. In a hadith in the, narrated by Ibn Majah, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu reported that he saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi perform to walk around the Kaaba and he said to it, and listen to this very carefully. He said to it, so this is the Rasul I'm talking to the Kaaba, okay? And he said, how good you are and how sweet your scent is. How majestic you are, and how significant your sanctity is. By the one whose soul of Muhammad وسلم, is in his hand, the sanctity of a believer, his wealth, his blood, is more significant to God than your sanctity. We are more important to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than we have. And we need to really connect to that because, you know, I think that there's so many psychological barriers 
to thank you for that and allowing ourselves to love ourselves in a sacred way and to see our value in a sacred way because I think we've associated connection with ourselves with arrogance, self-obsession, a lot of these things. And I teach a sacred self-love course. You know, I've been teaching it for a couple of years now and this is a course that I've been working on, you know, compiling for almost a decade. And it's because, you know, it took me a while to navigate these psychological barriers that we build up. Even me on a personal level, self-love used to make me cringe. Because you know, in the Western world, right, a lot of this, the way self-love is talked about, it promotes, you know, the ego, right? And it makes the self the destination. But I wanted to navigate, how can I have a relationship with myself that is rooted in my relationship with Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala? But one of the things, you know, teaching this course that I come across is this resistance to connecting to ourselves. It's resist this resistance to seeing our worth, to seeing our value, because we're so afraid of arrogance and self-obsession. But the reality is, is that if you cannot develop a loving relationship with yourself, if you cannot have a relationship with yourself that is wholehearted, that is nourishing, that is authentic, your ability to have any other relationship, healthy relationship, is limited. You cannot give what you do not have. So your ability to practice the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with yourself impacts the, the, your ability to practice those attributes with others. And so I found that there was like a gap, right? When we're taught a lot of the Islamic, a lot of, you know, when I was like even studying Islam and studying like the 99 attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're always taught to like, you know, okay, learn this so you can practice it with the people. And I used to wonder, okay, but like, how can we skip over ourselves? Right? Like, okay, I know that Allah is mercy, merciful. Allah is a Rahman, right? Okay, we're taught to be have rahmah towards His creation. But then I'm His creation too. Shouldn't I experience and sit with the fact that Allah is a Rahman with me? Shouldn't I sit with that, be present with that, feel that, that Allah is merciful to me? And then if I can experience that, if I can taste the sweetness of that, wouldn't that only impact and promote my ability to, to be more merciful to other people? Because you can't give what you don't have. And so we're like, we're taught to, we're always programmed, right? I love you for the sake of Allah. I love you for the sake of Allah. Do we even know how to love ourselves for the sake of Allah? But we're just programmed to say these things without any connection to it. <laughs> but love for the sake of Allah means that you see Him through your relationship with yourself. And then when you learn to do that, you also will see others through your relationship with him. This is what will lead to you actually loving for others what you love for yourself, which is what the Rasul says, right? You do not have Iman until you love for others what you love for yourself. And this is why we struggle with this in our community. We don't even know what it is. You know, we always talk about loving, and when we say this hadith, we always talk about the aspect of loving others, right? But you know what we miss? The end of that hadith what you love for yourself. <laughs> How many of us know what that even means? <laughs> we don't talk about that. And so, understanding that it's okay to learn to love yourself, but just the way that you do it has to be, you have to be you know, very cautious about that. The way that you, would, just as you would be cautious about interacting with other people, you're sacred, you're, 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 you're valuable, you're, you're worth it. <laughs> You know, you are, you are, you know, a creation of the creator of the world. <clears throat> and so just as, you know, Dr. Khan was saying, like, you know, he, he, he took time to create you. You know? How many of us think about that? And so, <clears throat> and so a lot of, you know, the, the barriers that I deal with in, in, Helping people navigate this relationship with themselves is this fear of arrogance and this fear of, you know, I'm going to be so obsessed with myself, I'm going to promote my ego. And I'll tell you, you know, because of that, we've adopted this sense of like false humility, and that's what I call it, like false humbleness, where, like, for example, someone compliments you and says, Oh, mashallah, you know, I, I really like this about you, you know? And then we, what do we do a lot of times? We, we, we deny it. We minimize it, right? We say, no, no, no. It's, it's like, oh, it's nothing. It's, you know? I mean, I used to do that until I learned that's actually not a form of gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See, that was false humbleness. That was actually not humbleness. That was just me scared to acknowledge what Allah gave me. And 
and many of us do that because we want to maintain this appearance of we think this is what piety looks like. Piety has nothing to do with what it looks like to the people. Piety has to do with how your heart is connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in every moment and how it prioritizes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in every moment. But when you learn to see value in yourself, your responses to what the creation noticed about you becomes completely different. When you understand that everything you have is an expression of love from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you see love as the foundation of everything you've been given, everything you've been commanded to do, everything you've been asked to do, everything that he has given you through Islam, you start to view everything as a reminder of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just as you would witness the creation, you know, just as you would look at a sunset and say, subhanAllah, right? Well, Allah created you beautiful too, and he says in the Quran, he has fashioned you in the best of forms. So, your responses begin to change. When someone compliments you, you say, alhamdulillah. When you say thank you, alhamdulillah. But you, you remember to thank the one who gave you that thing. And you say it genuinely. See, it, it, it no longer becomes about honoring your impression in front of the other person. It becomes about remembering the one who gave you that thing. Now, is that arrogance? Is that arrogance if you see something beautiful about yourself and you remember the one who gave it to you? Arrogance is you being the destination. You thinking that you're the source of that thing. You thinking you're better than other people because of that thing. Let's define things clearly so you don't live in boxes and masks and use Islam as a mask to keep you from living purely and authentically. And so you're, you start to see gratitude in what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You start to like um, really practice true gratitude. And I want you to think about this. If I gave you a gift, right, to express my love to you, or if a loved one gave you a gift to express their love to you, and you you look at the gift and you, you just, you know, put it to the side. So thank you and put it to the side. And then that person came later and was like, you know, notice that you didn't even open the gift. You left it in the corner of the room. You didn't touch it, you didn't explore it, nothing. Would that person feel like you're really grateful? No. But we do this with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We say alhamdulillah, but again, the programming. Alhamdulillah, but then we don't use his gifts. We're afraid to look. Many of us are even afraid to look. Like I said, I used to have that. I used to be afraid to look. I don't, don't tell me how I struggle. I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's like, but tell me what I have to fix. <laughs> right? But we are afraid to look, but is that really gratitude? Because when you give a gift to someone you love, you're giving it to express your love. You want the person who's receiving your gift to feel what? Your love. <laughs> and then when you don't even look at the gift, you're depriving that person of expressing their love to you. And you're depriving yourself of receiving the benefits of that love and feeling loved. Now, is that really gratitude? No. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given every single person in this room, every single person in the world, their own set of strengths, their own set of positive qualities, their own set of, you know, just like we get weaknesses, we have things that we have to work on. Allah has given you your own blessings, your own, you know, your, your own, the things, the tools, that if you're, your own skills, the things that you can utilize uniquely in this world, right? And yet many of us spend so many years of our lives not even looking. Not even connecting to what he has given you to navigate the world and maximize your potential on this earth. Because we think that's not humbleness. We think that's arrogance. Actually, that's a form of disservice to the one who made you. That is actually you minimizing and limiting your ability to practice Ibadah, which is what we started talking about. Because remember, Ibadah is about experiencing God. And he gave you tools to experience him. So how can you experience him if you're not connected to his tools? So then, how do we begin seeing ourselves through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's eyes? We begin getting to know ourselves. A, big, a, a very well-known saying that uh, in our tradition, a lot of people attribute the saying to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu but it, it it actually is not confirmed that it's from the Prophet Sallallahu it's, it's a but it was a very prominent saying of the righteous predecessors, which is an Arafa Nafsahu, Arafa Whoever knows himself 
knows his Lord. You know, in my journey of navigating this topic of sacred self-love, this coming across this statement was an opening for me in my journey. And I remember when I came across this statement, it, I, I literally had to sit with it because it, 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 it shocked me that much. It was the first time that I actually saw or read something in the text that linked my, myself and Allah in the same sentence. My relationship with myself and my relationship with Allah in the same sentence. I haven't heard it that way before. And so I took this statement to meet teachers and scholars, and I was like, what, what does this mean? You know, what does this mean? What, is, what, what, what can I learn from this? And unfortunately, because of, you know, the fear that, it, that there is that exists about, you know, loving ourselves and connecting with ourselves, even the answers I got were very limiting. They were, again, in the context of self-accountability and self-criticalness. You know, the more that you know yourself, the more you're going to hold yourself accountable. Which is true, by the way. I'm not negating that. That is important. You cannot, you know, this sacred self-love is not this fluffy kind of self-love we hear about where you only acknowledge your strengths and your good stuff, right? You do have to hold yourself accountable if you have sacred self-love. But that's not the only way we should be interacting with ourselves because is that the only way we interact with other people? Right? We don't. So then I felt like, okay, that's it. Okay, and I felt like, no, I didn't get my answer, so I kept searching. Wow. You know how I found them? You know how I learned the answer of this? You know how I found what I was looking for? Wow. Just by being out in nature. Just by observing the world. And I noticed that, you know, when I would look, or the more I would, like sat in nature, and the more that I observed Allah's creation, the more that it led me to who? Him. Why? Because the more I got to know something, the more that it led me to, to, to know who created that thing. When I, you know, I'd sit in front of the ocean or go on a path, a hiking trail, the more that I got to know these things, the more that I connected with them, the more that it led me to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then that's when I was like, well, I'm his creation too. So then if I get to know myself and I get to connect with myself, because when you're out in nature, you're connecting, aren't you? Mm -hmm. And that's where you receive the benefit, is when you're present, and you're still, and you're connecting. <laughs> then maybe, if I can be present, if I can be still with myself, I can connect to myself, if I can get to know myself, then I'll be connected to the one who made me. That's when I learned the meaning of an And so, know yourself. Get to know yourself. But be intended for Allah. Keep the eye of your heart on Allah. Get to know your strengths. Get to know what He has given you. Get to know the tools, the blessings. And then use them. Please use them. You know, the Rasulullah said that Allah loves to see the effects of His servants, bless, uh, the effects of His blessings upon the servant. Meaning that He likes to see the the benefits of his blessings being, you know, seen on the servant. He loves to see us use what he has given us. And this this was also another opening for me because it was like, you know, we minimize, we minimize, right? Like, oh, how can we get something new? Oh, it's nothing, it's nothing. Allah's giving you that. He wants you to use it. He wants you to enjoy it. And we see this in, in the way that the prophets, alayhum salam, were, in the way that the righteous predecessors were. When they got tested, they accepted, and they had a beautiful self. When they got blessings, they enjoyed it, they owned it, and they praised God. They did not minimize because they knew the greatness of who just gave them. They knew the greatness of Al-Wahhab, the one who has just the giver, right? And so please get to know yourself. Invest in yourself in a sacred way. Understand, look at you know your blessings, look at your tests as custom designed for you. That in every moment he is trying to unveil you from him and from learning about yourself because you are a tool to him. You are a means to him. So when you get a test, stop asking, why am I getting this? Stop asking, you know, like, why is this happening to me? But start asking, what is God trying to teach me about myself and him? Begin looking at life through this connected way that I spoke about earlier, which is through his oneness, through his tawheed, where everything is connected. So, um, when we can understand, so first is get to know yourself, right? Knowledge. Knowledge is a prerequisite to anything. Can you love something if you don't know it? No. And many of us, unfortunately,
unfortunately, you guys need to uh, conduct an introduction to yourself because you've never introduced yourself to yourself. <laughs> it's going to be uncomfortable. And I deal with this when I teach my secret self-love course. It's like, it's very like, is this okay? <laughs> you know? And I know because I've been there. You know, this, this journey for me is a personal one and a professional one, you know? But I get it. I get the cringe factor. I remember I was teaching the class and uh, a scholar came and sat in my class afterwards. He's like, you know, I, I, you know, when you said the word cringe, that's exactly how I felt when I learned about your self-love course. <laughs> and I was like, I know, I know, that's exactly how I feel. I felt, you know, for years, I, I was a, I was a self-love junkie for as long as I can remember. And I'm telling you, when it came to the word self-love, I wouldn't even go there. I'm like, I'll learn everything else. <laughs> I'll learn how to be authentic, and I'll learn about, you know, self-discipline and empowerment. But you know, self-love, you know, it's just, you know, it's nothing. And I wouldn't even go there. But it's important. And you know, it's not foreign. It just we don't we haven't talked about it. But it's always been there. It's always been in our deep. And remember. You know, one of my, you know, whenever you come across this feeling of like, I'm, I feel like I'm going to be arrogant again, go back to understanding what true humility is and what true arrogance is. And I love this quote by C.S. Lewis. He says, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. So there's a difference between feeling like you are valuable in front of Allah and feeling that you're important to Allah and, 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 and knowing your worth. And feeling like, hey, hey, I'm important, I'm important, I'm important. You know, like seeking that worth and like importance to the people. You know what I mean? Or like feeling like you're above people, that you're always thinking about yourself all the time. Because that's how much you heightened your understanding of yourself. Do you get the difference? So understand these, these, the difference between these things. And understand when you read the Quran and when you, when you learn about what he has commanded you to do and what he has given you. Know that everything that he has commanded us or forbade, even him putting, which is a lot of times, a lot of times people have struggled with, is that okay? Well, if Allah loves me, then why would He like create hell? Why is the punishment for Salah so, so, you know, so heavy then? So that's it. If I don't pray, I'm gonna go to hell. Then where's the love? Right? And so I can't. Uh, this is a whole other topic that you know I teach in my course, but I, I can't go into right now because of time. But I just want to give you one example of this. You know, when a mother loves, um, can we deny that a mother loves her child? Can we deny that? No, right? And actually, looking at the relationship between a mother and a child helps us understand how Allah is with us because we know that Allah is more merciful to us than a mother to her child, correct? Mm -hmm. So, look at a mother and her child. Sometimes a mother will tell her child that if he doesn't do something, that there's a consequence, right? A, a smaller consequence. But if he doesn't do this other thing, how the consequence is higher. Why? What's the difference? One, she knows that he needs to do more than the other, right? She knows the benefit that lies in doing that thing for her child. Because the child, the mother sees what the child does not, correct? So when you think about Salah, the reason that the consequence is so high is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that we need Salah, and He knows the benefit of Salah. And so it's just similarly, like for example, if a mother told her child, you know, if you don't come to the dinner table, I'm going to give you, you, you don't get dessert, okay? So what is she trying to do there? She's trying to say, so if you don't come out of hope for the reward and hope of pleasing me and connecting, you know, and, and feeling that love I have for you, then at least you come out of fear of my consequence. But at the end of the day, what is the end result? My beloved still comes and gets what he needs. He still gets to eat. That's what Salah is, our Silla, our link between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so when we don't pray, we are disconnected from a different kind of eating, nourishment, it's a different kind of nourishment. And so Allah knows how much we need that nourishment, so He's putting a consequence so high, so if we don't come out of hope and we forget that we need it, we come out of fear of the consequence. But Allah's love is there through everything. And so I will end with a poem that I actually wrote about this concept and I teach in my course, and it, it kind of helped me kind of reflect on Allah's love for myself and for others. It's called Al-Wadud, and Al-Wadud is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which means the most loving. I searched for love, and saw others search for it too. 
We may not have defined it as love, but it was something we knew. Something we had already felt deep within our soul, because how can we want what we don't already know? We must have gotten a taste of what love is, or a newborn would yearn for a mother's kiss. We came out of wounds already knowing love, like a nostalgic scent of perfume we yearned to smell it as it was. But nothing ever comes close to that love we knew. And when we think we found it, our longing for it only grew. It's like arriving at a mirage with our thirst unquenched, only to set out searching, only to set out searching again with hearts confused and quenched. Because that love we seek, that love our soul already knows, it was meant to be the fragrance, but we mistook it for the rose. It was created as the path, the means, but not the end, so that our soul finds its way by following its scent. A scent the soul already knows because it smelled it before, when as commanded it rose and a promise of it is more. It knew it was love before it even entered the womb because before it was nothing, and then it became something known. Because who would give what is nothing life and make it beautiful and pristine if it wasn't out of love and to make his love known and seen? Only the creator of love would be the creator of you and me because only he would create, nourish, and provide, but of needs be completely free. Allah does not need anything from us. A lot of times... When Love is conditional. What did you have to do to deserve to be created? Mm.